this you probably we need to be the one to be yes i'll just say next all right yeah. all right uh let's start uh today webinar good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to the petro teach webinar on elements of fiscal regimes and impact on emp economics and take statistics as you already heard from the organizer you are entering as listening only mode and muted before we proceed the event let us check if you receive my voice properly there is a window in front of your platform and by clicking on the arrow you will see the full window version with a chat box Please type the word hi or hello or something to make sure that we have established a full communication. Uh, please type something in your uh, chat box to make sure that uh, you can hear me. Okay, okay, yes. I think everything is okay. So, the agenda for today's webinar begins with a brief introduction to PetroTeach, and then we introduce our distinguished instructor, Professor Vumi Iledar. Next, we follow and listen to the webinar lecture, which lasts 45 to 60 minutes. And finally, we will have Q&A for 10 to 15 minutes. So, PetroTeach is a global provider of high-quality training solutions to the oil and gas industry. We are providing, at the moment, about 150 training courses by up to 50 distinguished lecturers with high track records from both academia and industry. Our training styles include online, public, and in-house courses. And due to COVID-19 pandemic, PetroTeach is mainly focused on the distance learning. For more information, please visit our website, www.petro-teach.com and download the course code. You may also follow us in social media and do not forget to watch our videos in the PetroTeach YouTube channel. So the event today is part of the 20 webinar series that PetroTeach will be offering during year 2020. For September, we started by Professor Bahman Tohidi, and he talked about nightmare of hydro blockage. And after that, Mustafa Hakkar talked about advanced petrophysics. Dr. Andrew Rose talked about seismic reservoir characterization. Jerry Rosnak about hydraulic fracturing. And also we had 3D printing by Dr. <coughs> Asiuk and Dr. Ishutov, sorry. And today, Professor Rumi Ledar we'll talk about elements of fiscal regimes and impact on ENP economics and take statistics. So welcome and we are pleased that Professor Wumi Iledar can join us today. He has actually more than 35 years experience in academia and industry. As you can see, his brief CV is right now GNPC Chair in Oil and Gas Studies, University of Cape Coast, Ghana. He is also Executive Director of the Emmanuel Egboga Foundation, Abuja, Nigeria. He is Chirota and Emmanuel Egboga Distinguished Professor of Petroleum Economics, Professor Emeritus of Petroleum Economics and Policy Research, LSU Center for Energy Studies, Immediate Past President, Nigerian Association of Energy Economics, NAEE. He is also former <clears throat> President, United States Association of Energy Economics and International Association for Energy Economics. 
right now he is a SPE director for Africa region, Dallas. So uh, let's move to the presentation. I wanted to remind you all that you can post your questions using the same chat box introduced at the beginning. As the Q&A session after the lecture, they will be answered. So I'm going to hand over the talk to Professor Wumi Ledar to address his presentation. Here you are, Wumi. Let me make you as presenter. No, I think you. I think you need to be the one to use it because I don't have this presentation. It, it, the download did not work for me. So. Okay. Okay. No problem. Yes, please. Let's so, go to next presentation. I'll just see next, next when I finish this slide. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Here you are. Okay, can I, can, I, can con I can control it from here. That's fine. Thank you okay, very much, okay. uh, Professor Hassan. And uh, I appreciate this invitation and I welcome the, the participants. Again, this is just a preview of some of the courses we intend to run in the future. And uh, I really thank you. I'm currently uh, speaking to you from Cape Coast. Uh, one of the most beautiful cities in the world and one of the traditional university uh, that has served Ghana with a lot of uh, tradition. Uh, basically, um, my special specialty is spectrum economics, um, also with respect to upstream. And I hope you could hear me very well. Uh, my aim today is to give you a good understanding of the general fiscal elements of fiscal regimes and rent extraction mechanism uh, and like you to keep in perspective the mutuality of interests of stakeholders. So basically what we are going to do today is to give you an overview of petroleum economics with respect to upstream. And when you talk about petroleum, practical petroleum economics uh, has two components to it, fiscal regimes and discounted cash flow analysis, which is designed to be able to help you evaluate standalone upstream projects or a consolidated projects in terms of what we call profitability of an asset. But there's no doubt that uh, there, there's an endowment of petroleum resources all over the world. And the distribution of it is uh, concentrated, more so in areas where the consumption is higher than production, with the exception of the Middle East, where one can say they are developing and they have a lot of resources, but they are certainly producing more than they, require, they are required at the current uh, economic development stage. But when you look at other parts of the world, you will see the need for abundance uh, of energy. And as a result of what could happen in the future, you see that where petroleum is mostly consumed today, the thinking is to follow the energy, energy transition to a new uh, sustainable energy uh, with climate change in view. But it is very important that because we have a lot of uh, regions with abundance of petroleum and there's not a lot of money from those regions where we have oil, money has to flow from somewhere else to be able to develop the resources to translate it from uh, resource endowment to capacity to meet energy need. Let me leave here because uh, I think uh, if you look at the law of demand and supply, you would think that they are not in sync with each other. The only thing they are all trying to influence is the price of the product. So let me say again that the importance of petroleum with respect to sustainable energy development worldwide is still uh, in view 
till 2050 or beyond. So talking about fiscal regime is very important, both from the point of view of the investor who's going to bring the money from somewhere and the owner of the resources, which mostly are currently in the less developed economy of the world. So the drivers of petroleum resource development uh, can be grouped into three economics. And uh, you look at the growing energy demand, more so in the emerging economies and other economies like South, South Korea, India, China, and, and even potential emerging economies with a lot of populations like Nigeria. Those are the things driving the need to look for more oil and gas if we want to continue to improve uh, the prosperity of humans. Again, uh, if the world oil prices is trending downward, then something has to be done to incite people to be able to look for oil and gas. And this is where fiscal system design comes into play. Another important driver is technology. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Your, your slide is not changing. Did you change your slide or is it on, still on the first slide? No, I'm changing it. Maybe that's why I say maybe you should change it for me because I'm already on the third slide. Talking okay, about okay. development. I can see it change on my screen, but because I cannot see it. But I can change it from here. I can change okay. it from here. So now we are in slide number eight. Petroleum resources, reserve, and development drivers. Okay? Okay. All right. So I was saying before that economics is very key to resource development. Economics is the driver, is the signal that will make people look for resources. Economics is also the signal that will make people consume it. Economics is the driver with respect to the demand, and economics is the driver with respect to supply. So we have to keep that in perspective when somebody is going to bring his investment. Technology is equally important, and technology is expensive. The one of the driver of what we see in the oil and gas uh, supply worldwide today is drilling technology, the directional drilling, and the ability to be able to go in miles without deviating. Steerable down old motors have been able to translate uh, oil and gas development. Then, of course, my focus today is public policy. And that's uh, where. Let me, give, let me give a mic. Are you okay? Yeah, uh, Prof, uh, please tell me when I should change the slide. I will. I will tell you. I will tell okay, you. now we are in slide number eight. Yes, and then public policy okay. is so critical to be able to develop petroleum resources from the point of view of the owner of the resources, which mostly are government, of the central government, and also from the point of view of the investor, who would like to be able to make value, expand the value creation or bring them money. Next slide, please. So, Next slide, please. So basically then when you look at fiscal regime, which is the objective of this, is a public policy uh, tool to be able to do a lot of things. First, people must realize that petroleum is an exhaustible resource with intergenerational implications. So whenever you design a fiscal regime, there are four things to keep in mind, please. One, you can need your enter to describe the legal, regulatory, and financial elements for the development of the resource. And so that would qualify to documentation of the policy, the legal, and the conceptual framework underlying the development of petroleum resource in that particular region. Second, your fiscal regime must define the relationships between the mineral owners most of the time, the central government of the country and the investors. You must properly define how you are going to relate to each other. 
this is where governance becomes so much important and the relationship between government and the investors must be clearly felt out. So, the fiscal regime must determine how costs and profits are shared. Costs must be recovered equitably with respect to on time. And whatever remains between total revenue and total costs must be properly distributed in an equitable and acceptable manner among the stakeholders. And the stakeholders are many in any particular country. Even in the United States, the gov central government is a stakeholder. State government where petroleum is found represent another set of stakeholders. Communities where petroleum is discovered represent another stakeholder. So your fiscal regime must be able to demonstrate the understanding of the stakeholders and their needs. And finally, this is where you think in terms of life cycle management for petroleum. And this is where intergenerational importance comes in. And this is the fourth part of such fiscal regime design. If you go to Nigeria today, they are, of course, they started 20 years ago and they have not been able to come to conclusion. We hope they will before the end of the year. We are going to see their current petroleum industry document for 2020. It has four parts to it, according to Grapevine. Part one, we deal with governance and administration. Part two, we deal with lease administration and uh, lease uh, allocation. Part three, we deal with fiscal framework to be able to define the fiscal regimes and terms to be able to accomplish these four goals. And finally, they have the fourth one that has to do with those government, which is dealing with the relationship with the community where oil is produced. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Well, basically then you must put into consideration the objectives of the government. Correct the slide. Yes, fiscal regimes and government objectives. Here, you must realize the primary objective of the government. And for most government in producing countries, they want maximum economic benefits for the country. It is more of how to get the best for the economy. That's the primary objective. Now, the other objectives are equally important when they are trying to design a fiscal regime. One, they want efficient resource development. And that is for Ghana, for example, the role and function of the Petroleum Commission is resource development in an efficient manner. In Nigeria, that is the role of the Department of Petroleum Resources. In the United States, that is the role of Bureau of Oil Energy Management. Efficient resource development. Two, they want access to technology. So they don't want to design a fiscal regime that will not uh, encourage people to bring technology to their domain. And they are always interested in the design of fiscal regime, skill national manpower. That's exactly what brought me to Ghana. GMPC wants to develop experts in petroleum economics management and finance. And finally, they do not want to design a fiscal regime that we discourage investment. Now, these are the objectives of the government. Next slide, please. Now, this is where, again, you must put into consideration the objectives of the investor. And primarily, they want adequate, sufficient, and fairly acceptable return on investment. They want to be able to make sure that there's value created 
when they bring their investment. And so they tend to look at the government school gym to make sure that it is attractive and competitive. And this is very important for foreign uh, investment to flow. Because if they look at your fiscal system design and it's only towards fulfilling your objectives without putting into consideration investors' objective, they won't come and your resources will not be developed. Next slide, please. So what then are the elements that the government can use to design their fiscal systems so as to be able to accommodate the objective of the government and the objective of the investors? Over the years, there is a generally acceptable two classes of what I call the two broad categories of arrangement that the government can design to attract investors. And it's just a classical rent extraction mechanism and governance of upstream business. Basically, they are into two categories. For those who want to know more into details as to how we model and evaluate these two arrangements, please join us in uh, November and uh, January, sometimes January, so January 2021, uh, whereby you can see how these arrangements have been used all over the world to be able to accomplish the objective and goals of both investors and the government. Remember, it is the responsibility of the government to design this arrangement. One is what we call concessionary, which is actually a complete transfer of ownership of resources from the government to the investors with some demands. And the demands could be what we call signature bonus, it could be royalty, it could be taxes, it could be levies, to be able to help the government obtain some rents from that oil production and gas production so as to be able to meet their objective. Now, the second category is called contractual arrangement, and they have different types. In Nigeria, for example, we operate both concessionary and contractual in Nigeria. In Ghana, we started initially with production sharing contract, and then currently it is concessionary. You can design your fiscal system, and if you participate in our course in the future, we are going to teach you how to design this fiscal system and evaluate which one is preferred to the other. Next slide, please. Now, we quickly look at selected countries, about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, ten of them in the Americas, in Europe, in Africa. And we see that uh, the most common is concessionary. And the difference between the two is simple. That to do with ownership transfer and retainance of ownership. In the contractual, the ownership of resource is transferred for a period of time. In the contractual, the government contractual, the government retains the ownership. And we see that the most common among these 10 countries is concessionary. Now, how does then government extract the rents in such a way that their own objective, objectives are accomplished and investor? They use what we call classical elements of fiscal system. And there are three broad categories of the type of instruments they use. One is royalty, which is a payment made to the owner of the resources. Two is taxes, which is more or less like a levy and a fee. And they come in different shapes and the design of them are different. And three is, are the incentives that the government put in place to incite or to bring you to do what you will not do. It's more or less like prayers. When you offer prayer to God, 
It is an invisible element that makes impossibility possible. The same thing with incentive that the government can put in place when tough times are there and companies are not willing to invest, the government can create an incentive. I remember in 1992, 93, I wrote a paper when I was at LSU describing why the majors were moving from the Gulf of Mexico to Nigeria. Because in Nigeria, then they created a petroleum sharing contract with 0% royalty in deep water and 100% cost recovery limit. That was so attractive. And they were moving. And what did the United States do? They decided to pass what we call Deep Water Royalty Relief Act, which suspended the payment of royalty to the federal government in the United States. So this is how you use incentive, and it should be part and parcel of your fiscal system. Of course, there are other instruments which are commercial that may be negotiated whenever the contract is supposed to be signed. Again, if you are interested, please join us in November, and we're going to go into more details with this. You could see the extraction of uh, uh, rent during oil and gas development can go from zero to 40 something years. And that's why the government has to decide when designing a fiscal system, whether they want to pay attention to early rent extraction, next slide please, sorry, early rent extraction or delay rent extraction. You see, from the investor's point of view, they would rather ask the government to wait until profit is declared before they pay taxes on profit. But the government wants to be able to get something, either because of incompetence, to be able to ensure that costs are benchmarked so that profit could be guaranteed. Governments always prefer limited risk. In fact, the way to describe governments when it comes to petroleum production is that they are risk averse, so they want it now. So they have the tendency to emphasize early revenue extraction mechanism, which is signature bonus, royalty, production bonus, discovery bonus, uh, another levy. Next slide, please. So, so the desire of your fiscal system to be able to account for uncertainty in a way what you don't know requires what they call a sliding scale. Or another word for it is when you desire a fiscal system, you want it to be progressive. Some of them, there's nothing you can do. They are regressive because they are not tied to profit. But you can design them in such a way that they are less regressive. And so what you do is to tie them to production or profit measures. People have moved away from fixing royalty to be constant. They want a situation that it can change with respect to situations. And if you want to tie it to production, then that means at a lower production rate, you are going to have less of the instruments you are using. And at a higher production rate, you are going to have a higher instrument calculation or rate. This in a way can make a smaller field that will not have been developed to be developed because they are not paying as much royalty or taxes as a result of that. You can also tie it to profit whereby you can use what we call internal rate of return, which is the project performance indicator, or you can tie it to what they call R factor, which is the ratio of your cumulative revenue divided by your cumulative cost. So as the ratio increases, the government can demand more share of the rent. All of this we are going to be able to model when we come to the future, and you find it you know, palatable to you to attend our course. But we study these 10 countries again and see how many of them are tying their instruments, royalties and instruments, into production, oil and gas price, or well productivity. We observed that for most countries that are doing progressive royalty, they tie it to production or oil price. 
Again, we look at the countries to find out how many of them are doing progressive royalty, how many are doing fixed royalty, how many of them are doing both. And if you look at the color, 32%, I mean, 26% are progressive. In that case, as you make more, you pay more. When you make less, you pay less to the government. And then of course, you, you find about 16% are doing both. And then, so if I'm the third now, I put 16 plus 26, you're going to see that uh, that's about uh, 42. 42% uh, have some form of progressive. And if I put 16 plus 32, you see 48. So there's a tendency to have a fixed royalty than progressive among these 10 countries that we have. And of course, we have about 26 percent of those countries that we study, they do not have royalty at all. Now, when you look at Nigeria and the Americas, you will see the range of royalty that they, they impose uh, in the country. Whenever you see a range, that means it is not fixed. That means it is sliding, either sliding with production or sliding with, uh, or sliding with, uh, with our factor or something. And then of course, you see the taxation mechanism, which is another instrument. Remember, I told you the classical instrument. One is royalty. Two, taxes. Three is incentive. Again, you see that 76% of the 13 countries we study has what we call a single tire tax system. And you see about 24% has a double tax system. So all of this will help you. But you must think in terms of the level of maturity. You can't compare what they are doing now with what you are doing now in some countries because those countries who are beyond you. I don't expect Ghana, for example, to copy exactly what Nigeria did because Nigeria is 60 years old, even 62 in oil production, whereas Ghana is only 10. So you have to design your fiscal system looking at global best practice that's subjected to local needs. As long as you observe neutrality, stability, and flexibility, and pro progressivity in your design of fiscal system. Again, we try to look at Nigeria and the Americas, and then you could see petroleum tax, Nigeria is between 40 and 65 percent, corporate tax, you could see the, the Nigeria has a single tax system, whereas in Brazil, they have corporate tax system. And they, in Canada, they pay corporate tax and they pay state taxes. The same thing in the United States. And then of course, you have additional petroleum tax. Nigeria is introducing a 0.5% per dollar additional tax. And of course, when you look at uh, uh, the Americas, and you could see the type of incentive that is given to them, capital allowance. When we come to the next uh, session of class in November, if you are interested, please register. We're going to spend more time with some of these things that we are giving you an overview. Now, we look at uh, some European countries and compare it to Nigeria, and then you see that other countries, they don't pay bonuses, whereas Nigeria does pay signature bonus. And then you could see the range of their taxes. Are this just the generic uh, fiscal elements in some of these countries? And then, of course, next slide, please. I'm sorry. Next slide. Now, when you look at concessional fiscal system value drivers, uh, again, remember the value drivers are royalty, tax, and incentives. Capital allowance is a form of incentive to help you spread out your capital investment so as to be able to calculate your taxes accordingly. You could see uh, that for concessional fiscal elements, with the exception of Norway and UK, and that's only late, they were paying royalty and tax um, uh, in the UK and Norway before. But there's time for you to, to, to be able to change your fiscal regime if you have a mature political system. It shouldn't take a long time for you to be able to change your fiscal system as long as you get the confidence of the investor in, in, in place. I just run through this. If you come again, we are going to be able to model all of this. When it comes to contractual, the fiscal instruments
include what we call cost recovery limit and profit or split. The cost recovery limit is an important component of the contractual fiscal system, especially the ESU. Next slide, please. Uh, yes. I just next. finished contractual fiscal system. All right, so the next slide then is to look at the generic value distribution. Look at the yellow. Am I in the correct slide, please? Yeah, Am I yeah the slide green. Off? Generic value distribution. Mm, generic fiscal right. elements. No, no, generic value distribution. I'll keep going, sorry. I was speaking too fast. You're going to see uh, revenue is equal to hydrocarbon price times production. Have you seen a generic value distribution? Yes. Okay. Sorry about my not remembering to tell you. So you see the typical value distribution, and you can see the yellow. The bigger the yellow color, the more up, the more interesting the fiscal region will be. And you see the green, that is the cash the government received, and the blue is the cost recovered. So if you put blue plus profit, the yellow and blue, it, that makes the company happy. The incentives is not, it's reflected in the tax that you are paying. And so that's going to be double counting. That's why I didn't add it to it. So, and the companies will be looking at the size of the gray in comparison to the size of the yellow. And optics matters. What you see attracts you. And that's why the government is very, very conscious of the type of image it projects when it comes to in, in, inviting people to come and invest petroleum resources. So what we did is to take a typical project, deep water project, with the cost profile and production profile, and tested about 10 fiscal regimes to see which one is adding most value to the investor and which one is adding more value to the government to demonstrate this important aspect of what we call neutrality. And then we use simple equation, we call it performance uh, indicators, net present value, which is more or less a discounted cash flow summation over a properly defined economic life of the project. And we also find a discount rate D that will make that NPV to be equal to zero, which is called the earning power of investment. Uh, certainly, if you have the privilege of coming to our, our class in November, we'll teach you how to use this equation to evaluate project. The beauty of it is that this can also apply to non petroleum project, like building a refinery, building a gas to power, that will, that will demonstrate it with upstream projects for you to be able to see how to use it. And then finally, you have another indicator that's called profitability index. And this particular indicator is very good for ranking projects in terms of which one is best, what combination of your project will give you the maximum worth for your investment. Especially if you have budget constraint and you have to decide on non-mutually exclusive projects. Again, the, the performance indicator, like I said, the definition of your earning power is the discount rate selected that will make the summation of your discounted net cash flow to be equal to zero. That is more or less an indication of your desired earnings when you decide to invest in petroleum products. So we decided then to look at two things. What is the access of government to revenue using this 10 fiscal regime? And you could see the blue is taxes, the, the orange is royalty, and then the profit split as fair for uh, production sharing contract. All of these terms we can explain more, but we just want to introduce to you how to evaluate a fiscal regime to find out whether it is going to add value to investors or destroy value to investors. Because this is very important when you are trying to attract 
fiscal investment. This next slide, please. So if you look at this, this is fiscal regime comparison with respect to government access to revenue. Again, you are going to see that for Norway, their revenue is just from taxes, no royalty, no access to government revenue as a profit oil split, nothing. And then from this, you could see what it is again, which of these is emphasizing uh, government take compared to uh, economic value created. Again, we also look at these uh, indicators to compare government revenue from investment into the oil and gas sector and internal rate of return for the investors. We see some of these are equal concessionary regime as the same project internal rate of return and company internal rate of return because the contractor brings all the money. That is different from the PSC where, yes, the contractor brings all the money, but the government pays them back. And that's why you have a difference between company internal rate of return and project internal rate of return. And we rank them on the basis of project internal rate of return. And we see the top three among the 10 study group is Angola, Equatorial Guinea, and Ghana. When we impose their fiscal system on the project, a deep water project with defined reserves and cost profile. Am I in the correct slide, Prof? Sorry. Uh, yes, economic analysis of fiscal regime. Yes. Next slide. Which one? Economic analysis of fiscal regime. So I'm not using to used to say next next. Sorry about that. Economic. Uh... Economic analysis of fiscal regime. Yes. Okay. So I, I would, I'm sorry again. I was just saying that when we impose the fiscal regime of these ten countries on, I mean, ten fiscal uh, documents on a cost profile and production profile. You could see that UAE regime has higher government revenue. But you could see they are second to the last in terms of project performance. And then if you look at Angola PSC, they have the highest, uh, they have the highest internal rate of return, but they are stuck in the middle when it comes to government access to revenue. And so you have to balance it. And if you look at this graph, you will see that in a nutshell, the lower the government access to revenue, which is what we call discounted post-government take, the higher will be internal rate of return. So that means there could be a balance in which both of you, you may not get what you want, but you can shake hand and say, okay, I'm satisfied. And that's what you want to do when you do a fiscal regime. You desire a fiscal regime in which the investors and the government are happy, even though they may not get exactly what they, they are interested in. And again, we begin to compare all of these countries to see who is attractive and who is progressive. You see, the more progressive you are, the more attractive you will be. The less progressive you are, the less attractive you will be. So basically, you want to be in the fourth, in the second quadrant to the left. Because your attractiveness increases downward, your progressiveness increases to your right. Progressiveness mean, means simply you are waiting until profit is declared before government takes its own share. We also have uh, a normalized post government take against internal rate of return. Again, if you are to the right, you are to the right uh, quadrant, then you are competitive and attractive. And that's where you can easily see your investment flow will go to. Ghana is competitive with their current fiscal system compared to Nigeria and other 
the only person that's going to fare better than them in terms of uh, attractiveness and competitiveness is uh, United Kingdom. Yeah, and and, that, and then again, this is what we can teach you to do if you decide to come to our course, which is going to take about three days or four days. We are going to expand on each of these concepts and uh, you are going to be able to, to, to learn from your own different regime or companies how to evaluate the projects that you are about to do and make meaningful. Because there's other aspect that we are going to do in that course is to now look at your input in your model and define stochastic behavior to be able to move away from your single estimate, but range of estimates. And then you'll be able to estimate the likelihood that what you said will happen, will happen. And that will make uh, people will give you money to know whether you, you have met their tolerance level or you have not met their tolerance level. Let me conclude then that it is observed that globally, fiscal systems are designed to encourage substantial and progressive investment in the industry. While balancing rewards and risk are very, very important, enhancing revenue to the US government must be based on mutuality of interest. The investors must know, especially in most countries where you have petroleum resources that they have need. And psychologically, when they discover petroleum, the society expects certain things as a result of that discovery. So the the country, the government, uh, the companies must be aware of this and must not necessarily want the excess rent to be captured by them alone. It will seem that the important fiscal regime levers, such as royalty, profit split, cost recovery limit, and taxation mechanism in the existing fiscal regime must be flexible, stable, and neutral to balance the risk profile with reward expectations. If I'm not going to get adequate reward for my risk investment, I won't go. I'll go and put that money somewhere where there's less risk, even though the reward is small. Finally, a vital component of fiscal regime to promote competitiveness and attractiveness for fiscal regime requires strong institutions, policy, commercial, and regulatory. If you want your fiscal system to be effective, efficient, equitable, and ethical, you must have strong institutions. And there are three institutions that you must pay attention to. One is policy institution, which is separate from regulatory institutions and commercial institutions. Second, you need a commercial institution, especially if you are in a develop, developing economy, like Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, Syria, all of those emerging oil and gas producing countries, you need a national oil company that has a commercial orientation and they must be insulated away from the temptation to be in charge of both regulatory and policy. And finally, you, are, you need a political but I mean, an apolitical regulator who is not going to spear his rod for any incident of non-compliance if you are going to be able to add value to your fiscal system. Again, I want to thank you for listening. These are courses that are going to be expanding on some of these things I've run through in, in 40 minutes. And uh, I hope you will take advantage of this opportunity to be able to know something about economics. The economic aspect of oil and gas production is so critical because companies do not go to a petroleum producing province for social responsibility, as good as it is. They are there to be able to add value to their investment. Again, because the first one will be on 16th to 19th November 2020, you can register at uh, petroteach.com. But the good Lord willing, I'll be glad to expand on every aspect that I've spoken about this evening. And thank you very much for listening.